This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Let us pray. Lord, your word tells us that unless you build the house, our labor is in vain. Lord, we come together this morning, some of us carrying heavy loads, deep stresses, and much worry. Many of us have been trying to build our own houses, and we look to you now in faith, Lord, and we say, may you build the house. May you create in us a holy temple acceptable to you, one that does not involve striving but faith. And may we surrender to your love, which is with us now through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is a Covenant Sunday sermon, but before I get into it, I'd like to address what I sense and feel through the Spirit, which is that many of us have come here this morning with heavy loads, and you know what they are. And the promise of Jesus is this. Come to me, all you who are heavily burdened, and I will refresh you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the idea of a yoke is that just as one would use animals to pull a plow by yoking them together with a yoke around their necks, Jesus wants to gently take us to himself and walk with us each step of the way. Not ahead of us, not behind us, but right next to us where we are yoked to him. This yoke, which is easy, and a light burden, which means he does the heavy lifting, he does the plowing, he does the work. Our call is to surrender to his strength in us, in his name. Today is Covenant Sunday. Perhaps you received a letter this week warning you, preparing you, getting us excited for this day, which we partake in once per year, as we look to the Lord to build a house. This is what we call a stewardship Sunday here at St. Paul's. Now, at first glance, it appears that this passage in Mark is perfectly placed to support sacrificial giving. A church fundraising team's dream, right? Here the message might be that the widow is giving so much more out of her poverty than the rich are giving out of their abundance, and so we too should give sacrificially like the widow. There's that word should. There's that burden. There's that requirement. Yes, we should do better. We should do more. This might be the interpretation that inspired the creators of the lectionary to place this particular text in November, coincidentally enough, during church pledge drives. And I can guarantee you there are many churches out there on this Sunday morning doing just what we're doing, talking about budgets, talking about giving, talking about how we can do better, do more, what we should do. But what if I was to tell you that this is wrong? Very wrong. The scripture is not a natural fit for stewardship, actually. Not in the way we think. So just as the word of God challenges us, let's challenge the system that places it here this morning. In a close reading of the text, this is definitely not what Jesus is saying. That is, do better, give more, you should do this. I mean, we could read it as Jesus elevating her as an example for us to follow. But then we would have to ignore the previous verse, where Jesus' focus is set on the scribes who, as he put it, devour widows' houses. So Jesus is not saying, can you believe how great she is? But rather, can you believe how unjust The temple system is that it would require of this widow all that she has to live on. In other words, God's house, according to Jesus, is hopelessly corrupt. Don't support it. 
How's that for the beginning of a stewardship sermon? It's okay, Vestry. We have good news coming. Jesus is the head of this church and our budget. So Jesus' critique comes just a few days after he has gone to this temple, overturning tables, driving out the money changers, and declaring that they had turned the place into a den of robbers and thieves. Shortly, he will say that the whole structure would soon be destroyed. So here's the scene from our gospel reading. Jesus is sitting opposite the treasury, watching the crowds approach to put their money in, and who should appear but a widow, the most vulnerable in society. She has her two small copper coins, which Jesus will describe as being all that she had to live on, her whole livelihood, and dutifully she puts them into the collection. This widow now walks away from the temple with nothing to live on. So Jesus refers to her as an example of how the temple has failed. Not that he criticizes the actions of the widow. She has nothing but faith and the desire to do the right thing. But this is all in a bigger context of the temple. Jesus is highlighting the temple's economic exploitation of the poor and vulnerable. And this is part of Jesus' prophecy about the destruction coming to this temple. Now, in case we have doubts, all we have to do is go back and see what he'd said about the scribes and then go to the next two verses that come when Jesus walks out of the temple. If we keep reading in Mark into the next chapter, there he is with his disciples and one of his disciples is looking over the immense temple structure. He's very impressed And what does Jesus say? Thank goodness that this widow is supporting the maintenance costs? No. He says, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. What's happening here with Jesus? What's happening is that he's redefining temple worship by referring to a new temple emerging. People in his day couldn't believe what he was talking about. They couldn't see it, but listen to his words. This is what he declared early in his ministry to the religious authorities. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it In three days? The scripture continues, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples recalled what he had said. This means that through Jesus' death and resurrection, where the veil of the temple was torn in two, thereby ending our separation from God, a new temple was created. One that is just, holy, and acceptable, and accessible to all. And how do we enter this new temple? We come to it by coming to Jesus in faith. Our reading from Hebrews describes it powerfully. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is not a temple made of stones. It's not necessarily impressive to the outward eye, to the values of the world. This is a holy temple, invisible to the human eye, but accessible by faith as we come to Christ, knowing that he is the high priest who has sacrificed himself, who has given everything that we might live. He's the new temple. And this is where it gets very powerful for you. Even more so in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul would further clarify this new temple by saying, 
Your very bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Meaning that the goodness of God that the temple failed to bring people now flows to us as we are filled with God's Holy Spirit. This is so awesome that all we can do is tremble out of reverence in God's presence, knowing that God would choose us to be the temple, that we might be indwelt with God's Holy Spirit to bring God's saving power to the world through the message of Christ. Those are the truest riches we could ever have. So back to the story of the widow, back to Stewardship Sunday. The story about the widow is not a springboard to a visible pledge drive. Rather, it is a call to an invisible faith. A more fitting text for what we are doing this morning on Covenant Sunday would be Matthew 6, 3, where Jesus said, when you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, admittedly, we as a church are a bit unusual. We do not tally up our financial commitments. It is true that most churches do this because it is responsible, reasonable, and accountable. Not that these don't have merit. We just seem to be called here at St. Paul's to a different path. This is one that I joyfully inherited, and you've taught me about this. And now that we are walking in our 10th year together as rector and parish, it continues to work. I'm convinced. This has called me to live deeply by faith. Thank you for that. Our path is faith over sight. As we covenant, that is forge and renew a fresh relationship with God. And there is no fresher experience in walking with God than when we say, God, you are the Lord of everything, including everything I have. That's where the rubber meets the road in faith, really. These covenant cards are not pledge cards. They are simply a commitment between you and God, which no one else will see. And they will be burned after today's worship. Now, the risk is that some of us might think we don't have to ever give anything again, as no one will know. And believe me, that's what some of my colleagues often say when they hear about how we do things. They're concerned. And I tell them, come and see. You should try it. See, that's just the point. Unlike the temple in Jesus' time, we are not interested in keeping an eye on one another. We want to keep our eyes on Jesus while leading one another to a living relationship with the Lord to whom we must give account. And that's the seriousness of who we are and who he is. That we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, from Hebrews. With all this blessed good news of Christ's saving power, we also have the assurance that he's with us. And after that, the judgment... So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This close walk we have with Jesus is about knowing his mercy and his power, his tenderness and his righteousness, and that he is Lord of all. <clears throat> Jesus talked a lot about money. Did he love money? No, but he knew its power. And he also knew that it could prevent us from living freely in a living faith. And so he wants us to know the joy of being conduits as living temples for blessings to flow into the lives of others. And there's nothing more wonderful than giving to someone in such a way that really helps them. It feels really good. And that's just a foretaste of what Christ is offering us when he says, basically, surrender to me everything. It won't always be easy. He said, in this world, you'll have trouble. But lo, I'm with you always, 
even to the end of the ages. That's the promise that as we are gently yoked to Jesus, he will never leave us or abandon us. So to wrap up here, today is a day to support each other in the journey of what God is calling us to give. Whether it be financial resources or the other equally valuable keys of time, talents, and testimony. You know, you all give so much in those three areas in particular, time, talent, and testimony. They're very powerful and needed and a sign of a living faith. So we declare that Jesus is the head of this family. We declare that God will provide. And so for 233 years, it's a long time, the Lord has been faithful to this parish. And may we now walk into another year in faith and hope and love, knowing that the greatest of these is love. Amen.